a podcast about amazing people from an incredible state. Amazing Arizonans with Mike Broomhead. Welcome to another episode of Amazing Arizonans. When I first started to speak out and get involved in things, one of the first people I met was my guest, Rick Romley. And uh, it's so good to talk to you after all these years. It's good to see you again, Mike. It's, it's been, been a while. It's been a while. 20. Yeah. 2004 is when I jumped in, and that's when we met, was when you were, um, and you've had so many roles, governmental roles and things in your life I want to get to, but um, you were county attorney. That's correct. And there's so much to talk about in that regard because of what happened recently with the change in the office in the last couple of years and what's happening now, but just in general toward law enforcement. Is there a change in attitude towards law enforcement? Let's start there. Yeah, I think that there is. I think that there is... um Unfortunately, I think that there's a questioning of law enforcement, and I don't think that's real healthy. I think that there's been a a questioning of whether or not they could truly trust them in certain ways. Yeah. And uh, as as you, I am very strong supporter of law enforcement. Sure, problems do occur at, on occasion, but generally they're held accountable. But those are the individuals I, I can't say enough of. And you've dealt with it. You know that nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. Right. Because it makes the entire profession look bad. Absolutely. One bad cop can literally put this image of, a, of an entire department, you know, as a bad apple. And that's just unfair. It really is. I mean, uh, as you know, because you've done so many interviews, I have seen so many individuals with the the, the the courage of running into the fire to sitting here and saving individuals. Uh, that takes a unique amount of courage. It's, it's what we call service above self. They are willing to put their own life on the line. And I think that's where for you, and I want people to learn so much about you and how much respect I have for you because your service, I did not begin here in Maricopa County, no. but a uh, Vietnam veteran, right? severely injured right. in Vietnam. Uh, were you not named nationally Vietnam Veteran of the Year? That's correct. Uh, disabled, disabled Vietnam Veteran. Right. In 2001. Um, can you, can we go back? I want people to learn more about you because your opinions are so important to me, but for them to hear them from you, um, can you go back to that time of service for you? Uh, did you volunteer for the service? Were you drafted into the service? And talk about your time in serving the country. You know, I was uh, very young. I, uh, I, I joined the Marine Corps. I was not drafted. I actually joined with my very best friend. His name was David Schaefer. Uh, we went through boot camp together. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed a couple of months after I was wounded in Vietnam. I was in I, I, my MOS. That's what's your job duties. Is I was infantry, 0311. <laughs> Isn't that everybody in the Marine Corps? Is, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> I could tell you stories about it. Okay. But, but, you know, I, I, I joined the Marine Corps and I was sent to Vietnam in 1968 and I was wounded in April of 1969. And uh, I, as as with you, and you, you know, I know your brother who died in Afghanistan, Iraq. I mean, Iraq. I apologize. That's right. Uh, you know, he was he was, you know, killed in action. Uh, I I have such great respect for our veterans, and you know, the Vietnam era. I mean, let's 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 go back. I mean, as you said, um, that was a time in which our nation did not really respect those individuals that had served. Look, I'm the first one to say. If you want to argue whether we should be in a conflict or not with the politicians, the ones that are the leaders of this country, you that's fair. That's absolutely fair. But you should never question those that go into combat serving their country with the very best of intentions, uh, doing what was right. And unfortunately, we Vietnam veterans, we came home to a nation that didn't respect us. Do you think the nation learned its lesson at your expense as a Vietnam veteran, because that treatment was not how my brother's generation was treated. I I think they have. I mean, I think it took a lot of a number of years, but um, you know, we ha we Vietnam veterans we say never again, never again, never again should our veterans that have gone on to serve this nation should they be treated as we were treated, and I think that the nation has learned it, and I I think it was a very shameful time, and. Um, uh, I, I I will tell you that, you know, I can't tell you the number of individuals that come up to this day and thank me for my service. And that means a lot. The um, two very quick things. Um, one is 
when my brother was killed, it was the Vietnam veterans who reached out first mm. and always. And I think that was part of the lesson that you were teaching, Vietnam veterans were teaching that generation of citizens because my brother was killed in on Memorial Day in May of 2003. Memorial Day, oh my gosh. And that November on Veterans Day, he was inducted into the war memorial in our hometown. Yeah. And um, when we, during that time period, right after he was killed, somebody got a hold of us. And he, it was really weird because my other brother is a cop, so their phone number is unlisted. You know how that is. He somehow got our house, the phone number to my brother's house. And he said, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I own a restaurant in town and I want to bring you some food. And he brought a tray almost as big as this table of food. And he cried. He handed me the food. He hugged my mother and he was crying. And he said, I was in Vietnam and we, I want you to know no one feels that way about your son. And they hugged. And then all of the Vietnam veterans, including him, showed up at that memorial. They all stood in the back. None of them would sit. And when the service was over, every single one of those veterans lined up to hug my mother. Mm -hmm. And it was such a tribute to them making sure no one suffered what they suffered. I, I can't talk about it without tearing up. I'm tearing up too. Because it was such a, an act of kindness and selflessness born from the pain that you had to suffer, not just the physical pain. And it was horrible what you had to go through. It, it was a difficult time. There's no question at all. You know, I, you know, as I mentioned, my best friend was killed in Vietnam a few months after I was wounded. But, you know, I was pretty seriously wounded. I was in the hospital for a year, a solid year. Uh, they did not expect me to live. I mean, I, I, they flew my father to the Philippines because uh, they thought that I, he might be able to see me for the last time. Um, I, did, I did make it through. And, you know, I, um, you know, not just those that gave their life for the country, but I, I, I think s we, we need to do a little bit better of a story of talking about those that, you know, that have served, that have been in combat, and, and the, sometimes the trauma that they've gone through, and the ones that have been wounded. I mean, it's a lifetime of having to live with those injuries. Well, and the significance now is with medical advancement being so much better than it was when you were right. injured, more and more are, are surviving their injuries, which is a good thing. Absolutely. But that means more and more are living with those injuries. I know it. And I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Um, you know, I don't talk about my injuries very often, but I lost both of my legs above the knee. Mm -hmm. I was hit in the abdomen. I was hit in the arm and so forth. But, you know, with the Afghan and uh, Iraqi veterans, the ones that... Uh, were wounded very seriously with IEDs and they've lost multiple limbs. Uh, the Marine Corps sent me over to San Diego numerous times to Balboa Naval Hospital because that's where they sent the very seriously wounded. And I talked to them about it. And, and you know, I, I'm a little bit different of a story. And, and I, you know, to be real truthful, you know, every time, um, you know, a, a, a politician or some leader would go up to a veteran that just had been seriously wounded. They go, how you doing, son? And they go, fine, sir, I'm doing well. Well, I kind of know that's not really true. You know, they're, they're asking themselves, they're 20 years of age, what's ahead for me? You know, will I ever be able to date a girl? Will anybody even want to date me again? You know, so it's the physical injury and the psychological injury. So I used to go there and I say, Look, your life's not over. Look, I, I'm now, I'm just about ready to turn 75. You can have a wonderful life. You know, uh, you know, there's a strength inside of you. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta dig down and find it. And I, I tell them about my career and uh, my family and my loving wife and how, you know, don't give up. You know, it's, it's, it's be difficult, but you know, I'm just as bad as you guys. But look, at, I'm also an example of what you can overcome. And I, I think it's helped a little bit. What motivated that in you? Oh. Because it wasn't just, I mean, serving the country, but it didn't end there. I mean, your injuries, mm -hmm. it could have been where I've done my job. But you went into public service as long as I've known you. You've been involved in public service. We're going to get to what you're doing right now. What motivated you to such service of the people around you? Well, I think that there's there's two things. Um, first of all, overcoming my war injuries, that was a challenging time. But um, Mike, I, I went into the uh, Marine Corps 
Uh, and I got, I was what we called a boot camp marriage. I married my girlfriend right out of boot camp and came back and uh, we had two children right away. And um, unfortunately that marriage did not work. And so I got custody of my two boys and here I am trying to learn to walk, figure out what my career is. All of a sudden it was not just me. I had to take care of my two babies basically. I mean they were, you know, three years old, four years old. So I so I I had another obligation. And but that instills in you there's this you know, those that have served I think that there's something more, there's something bigger or something more inside of you. That service really um, is very fulfilling. You know, and that's why I went into public service. You know, lawyer, you can make a lot more money in private practice than you can in government. But if there's something about helping, you know, your fellow person in some particular way. And as county attorney, um, as horrible of a situation that individuals are dealing with, you try to help them get through those difficult times. Tell you one story when I was wounded. Um, when I was first wounded, I uh, was not able to get back to, they sent the, the, the wounded to Japan. That's what, during my time in the Marine Corps. Uh, I wasn't able to get back that far because I was so serious. So they sent me to the Philippines at Clark Air Force Base. And boy, it, it was a tough time and you know, broken bones they can't cat you know just a whole lot of things going on and i gotta i gotta tell you and this is a story i've only told to a few individuals uh i was ready to give up i really was Hmm. um you know i i can't explain what pain really is you know pain medications hopefully it knocks you out for an hour but then you wake up and you're in horrible pain and after a few weeks, I was really getting close to giving up. And then they uh, brought in this young Marine who was just crying. Uh, really having a tough time. Mm-hmm. And he just, just said, let me die. Let me die. And here I am thinking, just a few minutes ago, I was willing to give up. But you know what you do? I said, don't you dare. It gets easier, but it hadn't. You hang in there. And that's that sense of togetherness. Mm. And um, I think since that point in time in my life, I realized the strength of giving something. Do you recognize that it is one thing to accomplish what you've accomplished, but what an example after what you had gone through to still accomplish that is even more of an inspiration to people. Not just inspirational to the people that have had serious injuries, but to everyone. Like, how dare I complain if I've seen what you've endured? Do you, do you recognize that? I mean, you are, to me, you have been such an inspiration since I met you. And it is, been, it has been knowing a little bit of your story, and I didn't know any of those stories, but that you have always seemed, everywhere I was, you were. Here you were an elected official and you already had this kind of pedigree, and I was just getting my start going anywhere anybody would let me, and you were there at every turn. If it was a veterans event, you were there. Mm-hmm. That was such an inspiration. Do you rec- did you recognize that, or do you recognize that in yourself? No, I, I'll be honest, I, I really don't, I mean, you know, people thank me for my service and so forth. I guess I just don't view it that way in in the context of um, I'm an inspiration. I just I, I'm going to progress probably a little fa- bit faster than you wanted. Gotcha. We'll go back because I got uh, okay. more questions. Be- Look, Mike, there's not a person in this world that doesn't have their unique challenges. Maybe not like mine. Right. But everybody has some difficulty in their life. They lost a loved one, a brother. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, their mother just passed away. Whatever it may be, everybody has challenges. And you know, right now I'm a veterans court judge. I, I, I do that. And you know, I talk to every court, at every court session, I kind of talk to them a little bit about it. And, and one of the things I try to instill is that I said, you know, 
all of us have difficulties. And you're going through one. I says, but, there, it, but there's a strength in us. I really do believe there's a strength inside of us that allows you to overcome those things. Mm-hmm. So don't give up. I don't think of me as that inspiration. It's, it's just that I, I guess people know that I've gone through it. Mm-hmm. I'm just another one of everybody else. You know, I'm just a different story. But that's, that's all I am. I'm just, a, I'm just a different story. But that's the humility in you speaking. Uh, well, that's nice of you, but I believe it. I mean, I'm just one. I want to go back just okay. for a moment. And I'm gonna, maybe this question is going to be too personal. But one of the people that we had interviewed in this, uh, in, in this series was uh, Jason Schechterly. Oh. And one of the things that Jason talked about was how his children had to deal with his injuries. Yes. Was it difficult for your, is it too personal to ask? Was no, it difficult not for your at children? all. You know, um, uh, I got married again uh, after I divorced my wife relatively soon after my war injuries. And I had custody of my boys. And um, we used to, we were very, 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 very close. And then I married my, my wife, Carol, who you know yep. uh, much later. And, um, um, you, you know, we, I didn't really talk a lot about my time in the service. They, they knew of it. I never shied away from it. And uh, I, I will tell you a, a, that my, my two boys joined the Marine Corps. I never urged them to do that. Uh, one had served for six years, had been deployed to Somalia during that conflict. Mm. My other son made a career in the Marine Corps. He was both Afghanistan and Iraq, and they came back safe. But I sometimes ask myself, why, when they saw the horrificness of what war can be? And, uh, you know, maybe going to your point, Maybe there was some type of inspiration that yeah, I, yeah. you know, I hadn't thought about that, but maybe. Um, is it is it different being oh. the parent of a marine? Harder. Okay, it's harder to be the parent when you're in the middle of a combat zone yourself. Yes. It's one level of right. angst and fear. Right. And you're young, and you think you know you're invincible. Right. When you're young, you think you're invincible. Although you see the horrors of war, and you go. Thank God it wasn't me, you know, that type of thing. But then your your children go. Oh, it was horrific. My one son, David, and I named, by the way, uh, as I mentioned, my friend that I uh, joined the Marine Corps with, he was killed over there, David David Schaefer, and I named my son after him. His name is David. But um, he was with what was called the 15th Mew, Marine Expeditionary mm-hmm. Unit. And uh, on 9-11, they were at the tip of the spear. So they were the very first ones into Afghanistan. Very first ones. Establishing Camp Rhino and everything else. I can't tell you how nervous I was because, you know, I, the, the uncertainty of war. Your training can be as great as it is, but the uncertainty of war. You know, uh, if your number comes up, you know, sometimes your training, you know, it can do a lot of good, but you just don't know. And uh, it was it was much harder to be the parents, and that's why I have such great respect for the family members, yeah. the the wives, the mothers, the fathers that are there, and they are encouraging them and doing everything they can, sending them the care packages, whatever it may be. But it's harder to be the parent. I just um, I just attended and spoke at a celebration of life for a young soldier yeah. who was killed in a training exercise. Um, and they were deployed to assist with what's going on, not in Israel, but in that mission. Oh. And uh, there was a training accident over the Mediterranean. There was a, a refueling mission that went sideways. He was a crew chief with a special ops unit. Mm. And to be there was so, it was such a reminder to me of that time I went through being on the receiving side of all the love from everybody, but to learn so much about this young man and to see the greatness of that family it's just you can't say enough about the families and what they endure, but also what they supply to a deployed person or to someone that's in the military. And um, maybe, uh, you know, I'm going to turn the interview on you. <laughs> I mean, you know, the loss of your brother. I know I know how much you loved him. I, Mike, I've known you for a lot of years. Yeah. And 
you have always respected his service. Mm-hmm. You have always given back more. You know, to, to our military, to our veteran community, you're always there. How many times have we asked you to MC certain events? Yeah. And you're always there. Yeah. And um, you're well loved for that. You're it's well a, loved for that. But it's a privilege. Uh, it feels like such a small part for who I'm serving. When you look at the men and women that are serving or have served, the sacrifices they've made, the loss they've endured, your injuries, but losing your best friend. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine that the hurt of losing your best friend was any different or any less than me losing my brother. Yeah. And so if in order, it has motivated me that I just wanna to continue to say thank you for their service. And unfortunately at times that thank you is going to the family members of someone that's yeah. given their lives. That's true. Let me ask you about, I've never asked you this, I, okay. now that we're talking. Okay. Um, did you have a relationship, uh, a good relationship with John McCain? Oh, very good. So be, uh, the reason why I'm asking I, is we're talking about res- the inj- I respect him so much. Well, the injuries he suffered, yes. the time he spent as a POW, um, I would imagine there had to be kind of a natural yes. kinship there. Yeah. Is it different with someone? You suffered many of the same kinds of things in a way. Did you have a different relationship, do you think, with him because of that? I think that there was a kinship that was inherently there because of that. You know, we didn't have to talk about it a lot. It was just inherently known. And, um, you know, um, I, I know at times, you know, you know, being a politician, you get – you. There's some that love you. There's some that don't like you and so forth. But for John McCain, you know, being a prisoner of war to being offered the opportunity to come home early because of who his father was, Mm -hmm. the being tortured as he was, and you know, not able to lift his arms over his head, you know, there that he was a great American hero. And I uh, we were very, very close. And, um, you know, when I left office, uh, he. He pulled me in and he asked me, Rick, I want you to pay very close attention to how good a care our veterans are getting in the VA hospitals. And so we had regular discussions about that. And you you saw John McCain. He was the one that led to a major reform in the VA when they were not timely getting care. Do you know that backstory? When when they came out in the media that this started in Arizona Mm -hmm. and um, I was so outraged I was doing the radio show. Yeah, I started reaching out to members of Congress and asking them, "What can we do? I want to do Good something." Good for you. The first person to call back was McCain's office, yeah, yeah. and his staff member said to me, "The senator just said to me that he will clear his schedule. He will be anywhere you want him, anytime you want him." So I said, "Why don't we gather some veterans together and do a media event?" And that's, that's cool. all I had to say. They got the Burton Bar Library. They organized an event. They sent out a press release with my name on it that I was the head of this. They did all the legwork, and John McCain and I stood on the stage in front of hundreds of veterans and all of the media from around the world, and I asked the question of the veterans. I said, I want you to raise your hand if you've waited longer than 30 days for care, and almost every hand went up. I said, keep your hands up, 60 days, 90 days. It wasn't until I got to a year before a significant number of hands went down. And I looked over at Senator McCain and his teeth were clenched and his face was bright red. And he was so, he had this seething anger on his face and he made a promise that day he was gonna do something about it and kept me informed as if I was important in this whole process. But he was dedicated to making sure that that wrong got righted. And it was amazing to watch that process happen. And you brought you brought a focus upon it. You yeah. I mean? See that 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 it's so important. It, it's not just the, the the leaders that you elect into certain offices. It's people like you. I mean, really, if you really want to get something done, you got to get the public involved. Right. You really do. You got to get the public involved, and that's when the change will come about. That's only when it'll come about because you know the voices. You're just one voice. You know. Yeah, but it, it was again. It was a responsibility to the people. You know, especially at the VA, that these are people that we have. They have written a check, 
you know, and we promised them that we would take care of them and we weren't fulfilling that promise. It was a no brainer that this is, and I love doing things in a bipartisan way, meaning yeah. those issues that transcend politics. Yeah. Everyone on both sides of the political aisle, generally speaking, respect the military and the veterans. Yes. We weren't taking care of the veterans. It seemed to me to be a no brainer that largely everybody would be on board with wanting to fix it. It seemed like a unifying issue, which is the reason why I thought it was such a great thing to talk about it was and you know i talked to family members in which the individual didn't get care in a timely manner and they passed away i did too and it, you know that's just i mean what's going on here i mean and john mccain and he was the leader in congress that moved forward with what was called the mission act at that mm -hmm. time and um there's been major changes in the VA, which well, is and good. The, and our our dear friend Dave McIntyre, yeah. uh, Tri West here. Healthcare, He's yes, been in here. yeah, and uh, I mean, um, I mean, we provide, a, I mean, major changes in that. If you can't get it in the VA in a timely manner, you know what? You can go to a private doctor. And of all things, that choice card came yes. about because he made the deal. He co-sponsored that with Bernie Sanders. I know it. Of all people, I know. So that shows you how bipartisan that could be. It is. And that was because the voices were being heard in Congress, finally. You know, the stories were so s outrageous yeah. that, you know what, something got done. And we could use a little bit more of that, truthfully. We could. we could use a little bit of that. So let's talk about your jump into public service. Okay. Was your first elected office and only elected office the county attorney? It was. What motivated you to that? Uh... First of all, understand my background. I had voted, but I was never really engaged in politics. I had never been to a district meeting or anything such as that. Uh, I was the I was a deputy county attorney at the time. I was the head of the organized crime and narcotics uh, division at the time at the county attorney's office. And what got me to to do it is that um, a few police chiefs had invited me out, and they asked me to run for office. And I had never even thought of it. I had never even thought of it. And I go, I, I thought I could do a little bit better of a job. And uh, this novice jumped in. I ran on um, victims' rights, a constitutional amendment. I was the only one that supported that. Uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, there, is a, <laughs> there is a lot of politics around it a little bit. But I, I was very vocal about it that I thought that the justice system needed to recognize and provide some rights to victims as they go through the criminal justice system. And lo and behold, I won. I won. And there was like seven of us running. Wow. Yeah. What year was that? That was 1988. I took office on January 1st of 1989. And you served until when? Uh, 2004, the end of 2004. Mm -hmm. Came back for a short period of time in 2010. I remember that. You remember that? A little controversy on some of those things. So, um, how did your wife feel about it? That my, you were running. Um, my wife was one hundred percent supportive. Good. Uh, my wife is. Trust me. I think I'm law. I think you're very law enforcement supportive. Nobody's as supportive of law enforcement as my wife is. Yeah, but to to have somebody, you it'd be one thing. You can take the arrows yes. when you're running for office. But if you love somebody that's running for office, watching them take the arrows yeah. has got to be a nightmare. It when is. I would, I, I know her well enough that if she were to read something about you that was negative, I would imagine it would make her want to strangle somebody. Uh, not really. I mean, really, she, she she was really very very stoic. She was always supportive. Always That's awesome. And you got to understand, I mean, you know, uh, county attorney, you get death threats. Uh, most of them you just kind of brush off because, you know, most of them are just yeah. like the, the ones you really worry about. I remember the New Mexican mafia in prison was the serious one. Uh, mentally ill yeah. are the ones that you watch out for. And they put cameras up in my house and all that stuff one time wow. and all that type of stuff. But she was always supportive. She was always there. She was... Um, she she wishes I had not retired back then because she was a real wannabe. Actually, I say that she's the real county attorney. Yeah. And I used to give that little speech to <laughs> certain groups and stuff like that. Do you um, – I want to talk about what you're doing now with the Veterans sure. Court because as we talked about before the cameras went on, um, I think everyone needs a chance – at rehabilitation. Yes. And many times people are committing crimes because of an underlying issue. 
whether it's drugs or whatever else it is. There is a uniqueness to sometimes what veterans endure mm. that only veterans can understand. Right. So can you explain what the veteran court does and how you approach it? Okay. Uh, veterans court is a specialty court. It's sometimes called a therapeutic court. Actually started out of New York, oh, about a dozen years ago. And uh, actually, Arizona is quite a leader. I mean, we have quite a few veterans courts here in, in Arizona. Generally, they're only available for lower level crimes. You know, of course, your, your murders, your sexual assaults, they're not, it's not appropriate for that. Those re- require true accountability and so forth. But, what they tr- but the idea is this. Um, you know, veterans, when they come out of the service, they sometimes have some unique challenges that maybe other individuals don't have in the community. Uh, you know, coming out of combat, a common thing that happens is that you, you have a hard time adjusting. Uh, it may be due to PTSD. You may have a, a post-traumatic stress disorder. Yep. Uh, TBI, which is you know traumatic brain injuries. Uh, sometimes it's just plain anger management. It's a hard time adjusting, and so you get in assaulted behaviors and so forth. So what we in in the veterans court do is that we try to, well, what we do do is that we we get that veteran evaluated a, a little bit different of a way. You know, they may be there on a drug charge, but we say, wait, the drug charge may only be the way you're responding to like what's- Like self-medication. Un- yeah, self-medication, that's exactly right. And uh, we get an evaluation, you know, through the VA and through other medical professionals, and we try to develop a program around them that deals with all of their issues. For example, if you have, you know, you may see the drugs, so you may have to have substance abuse uh, counseling in some manner, but it could be due to PTSD, and that's the, really the underlying issue. Mm-hmm. So we try to get in those services primarily through the VA. I mean, that's a unique thing that we have that most other courts don't have. We have the VA services available for us. And the VA is very supportive of this program. And I can tell you, uh, it's it's so much harder to go through our particular program because it takes a while. I mean, it can take two years to go through the program. But I will tell you, I have witnessed so many stories of success uh, that have led me to stay on being a veterans court judge, and I'm very proud to do it. Uh, I, I, I'll give you one. There was a domestic violence situation. The underlying issue was drinking and, uh, you know, tied to difficulty adjusting and so forth. And he'd finally completed the program, and uh, we'd do a short graduation. And But before I uh, agreed to, in, in this particular case, uh, dismiss the charges, I asked the wife to come forward. And I asked her, I said, you know, the state has filed motions to dismiss his charges because he successfully completed the program. They think he's doing pretty well. I want to know what you think. She broke down in tears. Broke down. Excuse me. And 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 I go, you do know what, right? And she goes, I cannot thank you enough. You have given my children a father. Mm. You've given me my husband. And that's a success. That's an amazing success. And, and given somebody that's probably very proud of their service, their pride back. And everybody in that veterans court watches that. Mm-hmm. And they see it. And they see that success. And no, we're not successful on everyone. I mean, let's be real honest. I mean, I, I, this one young gentleman, I, fentanyl, very hor- horrific drug. Mm-hmm. I, as much as I tried to help him, unfortunately, he overdosed and he died. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not all successes, but I will tell you, there's something unique. Veterans help veterans. They just do. You know, you got your six, man. Yeah. You know, no matter what, we've got your six. Yep. And they're there for them. And uh, it's a great court. It really is. If we could do more at the front end of the system. Look, I've, I dealt primarily with the most serious of crimes, felonies, murderers, so forth. But as a veterans court judge, I deal with a lot of misdemeanors and so forth. If we could do a better job of addressing what is going on in their life there, mm-hmm. 
we're not going to have these problems at the back end. Right. We're going to reduce the recidivism or the, the, the more serious types of crimes in our community. But the the I think the key word also is accountability. Yes. If you hold them accountable at the lower level and yes. they feel that sense of accountability. And I would imagine, maybe I'm wrong, but for a lot of the veterans, having to stand in front of a judge yeah. is a wake-up call. That they're now standing in front of a judge and they're having to be held accountable for their behavior, that might be the wake up call so that you're right, it's not going into a criminal court, a murder trial or something right. else. That's, that's, an, that's an incredible success. It, it really is. And um, what I'm told by, you know, I, I've got a pretty large staff that are supportive, you know, of everything from VA representatives to people in the community and so forth. Um, being a veteran, a combat veteran that was seriously wounded that also knows, you know, I tell them straight up, you know, I there's a line here. I, we will work with you. But the bottom line is, it's you that's got to accomplish it. You have to do the work. You've got to do the work. And I says, we will work with you. But if you don't, then I'm just going to remove you from veterans court. Just set the matter for trial. That's just the way it's going to be. And uh, being a, a combat veteran, they don't try to play the shenanigans with me you know they kind of know that i got their number so it's a it's a great program how long have you been doing it probably eight ten years somewhere around there I any was idea on number of cases you hear per year or per oh, month or a lot i mean um we have a lot of veterans in our community it's amazing uh, it's, a, it's it really is it's we a are a community. state that veterans seem to be attracted to so that's very very good I can't tell you. I mean, I, I'm on the bench again um, on Tuesdays, and I, I checked with my calendar, and I've got uh, 45 cases tomorrow. Wow. 45 cases, yeah, that I've got to go through. And that's that's a heavy docket for me, because I try, I've, I've told everybody, I want to spend time, I want to talk to the individual, I want to see how well they're doing, you know, I, you know that type of thing, and so that's so a heavy So in docket. this program, do they see you face-to-face -face and it's just the two of you? Are they represented by counsel? Is it like a regular courtroom? How does that work? Yeah, it's, it's a regular courtroom. I am on the bench. Uh, we appoint counsel on every defendant, regardless of ability, because they can hire their own attorneys, of course, but it's a complicated process. I mean, there's a lot of programs that they got to go through through the VA, and mm -hmm. sometimes, so uh, we appoint an attorney uh, to represent them, to help them through this particular process on every single case. Uh, I don't see them in a private setting. That would be improper, you know, from a legalistic standpoint. I just didn't standpoint. know if it was a one-on-one -on -one interaction where you lay the ground rules and they follow them, or if it's they're represented by counsel and it's just... They're represented by counsel, and we have a lot of support staff. We have always two individuals from the VA. Uh, they're called VJOs, Veterans Justice Outreach. Yep. Uh, they, are, they are there. Uh, we have uh, individuals in the private sector, because not always... Uh, is an individual uh, eligible for every service in the VA itself. You know, there's certain requirements under federal <laughs> law. So we, we have people in the community that are there. We have uh, mentors, you know, that are veterans themselves that want to sit there and, you know, be there in case they need to call at night, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I've got a staff probably of about 12 to 15 people that are there just in support of the veteran. Wow. Yes, it's very large. So let me ask you about legacy, because uh, I love talking to people about legacy. I keep thinking about this myself. I'm 56, but closer to the end than the beginning mm -hmm. of whatever I'm going to do. Do you think about that? Do you think about how you're going to be remembered or how you want to be remembered? Does that matter to you? It matters, but not with a big M. You know, yeah. uh, in in that sense, you know, I just I just want to that I made a little bit of a difference. You know, if you can impact somebody's life, that that to me is everything. Yeah. You know, I I like helping people. I just do. It's just me. And uh, you know, you know, my family's been here since the 1800s. I don't know if you know that. I didn't. Uh, we have a street named after us. I still say it still needs a little bit more law enforcement. <laughs> patrols to go around there it's a tough area where it's at uh, but you know if where it, is it? it it's primarily on the west side it's, it's romley street it's on the southern part uh, south of washington so it's you know in fact there was a murder there just the other day uh, <laughs> around 1900 west washington you know okay. somewhere around there um 
But uh, I didn't know that was named after your family. Yeah, it's been named after my family. My, my family's been here since the 1800s. So the wow. Late 1800s and so forth. Where, did you go to high school here? I went to high school. It was called West High School at the time. Now it's a vocational school on Thomas and 19th Avenue. Uh, where the rivalries were Central High School, North, Camelback. You know, I, I go back a ways, so I'm, I'm a little bit older. I talked to everybody here about the schools. You can tell how fast this place grew oh. because North High School is south of Central High School. That's right. Because of how quickly the city grew. That's exactly so right. So North High School is south, and Central High School is north of, of, of North High School. To show you how quickly it's grown, I remember Alhambra was just created yeah. when I was in high school. That's around, I don't know, Camelback and 35th Avenue, somewhere around there. That was a new school. I used to go dove hunting up on 19th Avenue and Bell, right by Turf Paradise. There was yeah. a bunch of orange groves there, yeah. orange groves. And uh, I mean, to show you how, I mean, don't you wish you would have picked up some property, you know, if you could back then? I have friends that grew up in Arcadia yes. when it was orange groves in Arcadia. Oh, yeah, yeah. And imagine... I know. If somebody had been smart enough. I know. To Paradise Valley. I mean, yeah. uh, what was the name of the restaurant? I can't remember the restaurant. You had to drive all the way on the west. Pinnacle Peak Restaurant or something. Uh, maybe that's not the name of it. I forget. Where they used to cut the ties off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But you had to cross 30 minutes of desert to get there, to the west side and everything else. Yeah. it, it, it The valley has grown. The valley has grown. And... Uh, you know, uh, a lot of Do challenges. Do you like with, it? No. Because you don't? No. I love what it's become. I'm worried. Here's, here's what I'm really worried about. I mean, we're moving into politics a little bit. I, I don't mind the growth as much as I, I am a little disappointed that we're not looking at it a little bit more holistically. Look, we're building and building and building. But the traffic is getting worse and worse and worse. We're not dealing with the infrastructure needs that are there. I worry that we're building all these apartments, but is that the right way to go? Because, you know, once that growth goes down, then they become slums. I've seen this. I've studied this as county attorney, what happens in other cities. Once that, you know, if it begins to diminish and so forth, are they taken care of well enough? So that causes prime crime. Well, that's the issue. And one of the things with neighborhood services in the city of Phoenix, I, I think that that's a great asset that the, the city has as long as they're on top of things. But the what we've been talking about recently has been about public safety. Right. That public safety is suffering in its budget, that we don't have yes. enough firefighters, that we're not, the response times are down. Phoenix PD is dramatically understaffed. And I think not just the police department, but a fully staffed, fully functioning public safety, including the county attorney's Absolutely. office. Absolutely, including if the judges. If we have right. that, I think what that does is foster accountability, and it keeps a lot of those things from happening. I hope so. I, I, I do hope so. But we still have the quality of life issues, you know, the traffic congestion and yep. so forth. I mean, people are complaining about that. And so I just wish that we would develop a formula if, if there's a better thing. Okay, so if we're going to be having this type of growth, then we have to create better infrastructure on these particular things. I mean, we look at water right now. Yeah. We've, we've got to start thinking about those things. We've got to, you know, not just the moment. We got to be thinking ten years out, twenty years out. You know, what is it going to be like? It's so interesting because this goes back to where we started with you in public service. Yeah. Do you like the growth? And you just went into all the public service reasons why we should be concerned. Yeah. And I think that's pretty amazing. That mindset of yes, this is such a beautiful place. What do we do to keep it beautiful? That's exact. That that's that's the real question. You've asked the real question. What do we do to keep it beautiful? I don't mind the growth. I mean, I think it's wonderful that Arizona is finally being able to strut to show that we are a wonderful destination to come, you know, to live, to raise a family and so forth. But how do we keep that quality of life? I agree. That, that's, that's the real question that needs to be answered. And it's not just, all right, we need housing. Well, okay, we might need to build more. But with that growth... What is that going to do, you know, with the traffic congestion, with the law enforcement, you know, all of those types of things. You've got to look at it in a full package. So. I, it's funny. I, we, I just talked about this on the air. Um, I had a house in the Arcadia area, kind mm -hmm. of Arcadia light. Mm -hmm. And the growth in that area is immense. I know. And they're landlocked. So things are going up. Uh, 44th Street and Oak, which is the midpoint street between McDowell and Thomas. 
huge apartment complex. When you drive up 32nd Street through the Arcadia area between Thomas all the way up to Camelback, apartment complex is going up everywhere. So on one hand, we need the housing, and right. I agree with that, but it does add to the traffic. And the thing about Arcadia that everybody loves is it still felt like that grown in neighborhood. Yeah. Do, the, do you think it's gonna cost them some of that identity? I hope not. I do too. I hope not. I, I really hope not, because that's something special. I mean, that's, I mean, that's Arizona. I yeah. mean, you know, we can't lose that. You know, we can't have growth just for the sake of growth. You know, we've got to remember who we are and what we are, and we want to keep that. We want to keep that quality of life. And, um, you know, you talk about more law enforcement. We've got to be able to recruit better. I mean, I, I think that there's real challenges right now of sure. recruiting individuals and so forth. Uh, there's just so many challenges out there. I mean, truthfully, I mean, to me, the, the, the key issue of the moment is not – water, traffic, whatever, it's leadership. It's leadership. How do we sit there and identify issues and try to bring people together? That's, that's really the challenge today. I told you earlier that you're somebody that I admire. Uh, Who are some of the leaders you admire? Oh. You said I, it's about leadership. Oh, yeah, it Who is. Who are some of those leaders? Uh, John McCain, of course. I've, okay. I, I, we won't go there. Jerry Colangelo. I remember the mm -hmm. day when he was downtown you know, uh, I, I worked with him. Uh, well, didn't work with him. I was uh, the counsel for the Board of Supervisors when we built the Diamondback Stadium, you know, yeah. there. And, and he was on the opposite side of the table. I could not believe the leadership that he provided to the downtown area there. He was extraordinary. Uh, I, I worked closely with Phil Gordon when he was the mayor. He's a Democrat. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, we, we worked hard to... Uh, get slumlord legislation for those, yes. you know, to stop that. Or and a, Shannon's law, Shannon's law. And an adamant supporter of law enforcement. Absolutely. Phil Gordon. Son's a cop. Absolutely. His son is a cop. I mean, remember when uh, Shannon uh, was, was killed? I mean, this is New Year's Eve, I believe it was. Yeah. Shot up in the air, came down and yeah. it killed her. I mean, a beautiful young little girl playing in her backyard. And just a senseless And act. we worked together to get legislation to sit there and help law enforcement try to identify that and to slow it down. And, and to some degree, you know what? It, it's, it started to raise awareness. And so they started coming out with the new technology, being able to identify where the shooting's occurring and stuff like that. That's where when you, when you and, and you've got to keep doing it. I mean, you've been on KTR for a long time now. You've got to keep, you've got to keep pushing these issues. You really do. Yeah. Because it's only when the public really becomes in, engaged and force their elected leaders to address an issue that seems to get done. Yeah. You know, we just don't seem to get it done as, as quickly as I'd like it. Um, it's so weird because I wanted people to learn about you, which is why we're doing uh -huh. these storytelling things. I learned so much about you today, mm. and as long as we've known each other, but you, have, but you are kind of a private person about I am. yourself. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing the stories because I know they can be emotional, but um, I think they're important to hear. I think it's important for, for people like you to tell those stories because it's not just what you've done, but why you've done it, the motivations behind it. Um, I think it's going to be more of an inspiration to people. I think people are going to learn about you, but I think they're going to be motivated or inspired like I have been by you. So I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, it means a lot. It's wonderful to be with you again. I mean, see you all the time out there. I mean, you're, 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 you're very engaged out there. And, and I thank you for letting me be on Idol. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm an inspiration or not, but, you know, um, you know, people are generally good. I'm, I'm one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm the glass half full. Me too. You know, um, you know, and everybody's going to have a challenge. Just dig deep, man, because you know what? You can overcome it. You really, really can. And you also will find out, I think, in those moments that there are people out there, some that will surprise you, that are willing to come alongside and help you through it. Absolutely. There are so many wonderful people. You know. Sometimes we focus a little bit too much on the negativity. Oh, yeah, because you'll be surprised that there are people that you think you can count on that you can't. Yeah. But you will always find out that there are people that will come alongside that you may think have no connection to it. Yeah. But they will stand beside you through anything. Absolutely. And I, I get emails and people contact me all the time, you know, and uh, not, not just because they want me to be at one of their events to help, 
you know, raise the level of, uh, you know, recognition in the community, but because they want to help. I mean, they really do. And I've seen that in veterans court. I mean, I can't tell you how many individuals have gone through veterans court and then they all of a sudden want to become a mentor. Yeah. You know, to help other veterans as they're working through their difficulties. On the uh, backside of COVID, we started something called the Action Alliance on mm-hmm. the air. And it was just an idea that we were going to organize community service events. Good. And we wanted to open it up to listeners. Just uh, get on the list. We'll send you an email and a text message and let you know of upcoming events. And you can come to the events that you want. Over 500 oh, people my gosh. have signed on to get on the list. That's fantastic. We've been to St. Vincent de Paul. We've been to St. Mary's Food Bank. We've been to so many different places, and we've got more scheduled. We're trying to do one a quarter, and within 10 minutes of the sign-up going out, it fills up. My God. The, the community is just amazing. That's amazing. They will respond, like with the Veterans Court, they will respond in a way. We've never put a call out. St. Mary's Food Bank was, I think, twelve or 15,000 turkeys short of their goal for Thanksgiving this year. And within a matter of three weeks, people responded and they were able to meet their goal. And they're at record levels of people needing it because of the yeah. expense of food. Yeah. We live in an amazing community full of, full of giving people. You know, we need to learn to strut. We really do. We do. We really do. We need to learn to really strut because we are a fantastic community. I mean, you've been here for a long time Almost now. 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. Okay, so you've seen the growth. You've seen I've what seen Arizona... Some, not your kind of growth, uh, but... But, but you know Arizona. Yeah. You know... I mean, you get engaged in a lot of events. I do. I do, do. I know that. We're fantastic. And so, let's talk about that. I yeah. mean, I, I think that's fantastic. And I think shows like this, talking about people, you know, having individuals on and telling their stories and so forth. I, I understand you've had everybody from Luis Gonzalez to every, who Fantastic individual. Right. Luis is a wonderful individual. Yeah. You know, we remember him for the 2001 World Series. And, you know, the mm-hmm. little weird blooper. It was a weird yeah. one. You got to admit. But it won the game. That was a line drive single. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? That okay. Was a line drive single. <laughs> Never in doubt. Says. Never in doubt. Okay. I'll go along with that. So, but it's. I, I, I appreciate what you do. And I mean, it's funny you mentioned Luis because one of the things about that time with him in here was him talking about 9-11. Yeah. Because one of the things I we talked about was going to New York for the World Series. And I didn't know this, but this is a testimony to that team. They had made, because they were up. Yeah, they right. were They were, you know, on the verge of winning the whole thing. I know. They had made the decision as a team that if they won the World Series in New York, they were not going to celebrate on the field out of respect. Oh. And I thought, for every baseball player, that is the epitome of a win. Yeah. Now, it didn't work out that way. I know. It's they here. took seven games. Yeah. But to have the presence of mind as an organization to say, we're not going to do that to the fans in New York out of respect for what's happened. We're going to go do it in the locker room. But see, once again, we're right back. Big circle. There is such goodness in individuals that they think about other people's feelings mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And that's, that's really what makes us great. That yeah. really is what makes America I great. Agree. I really, I'm a, I'm a firm believer. You know, I am not one of those pessimists on America. You know, I've, I've worked with our youth. I, I, I'm sure you know about the Veterans Heritage Project yes, and so course. forth. You know, we deal with high school students in which, you know, they engage with other veterans and, you know, mem- memorialize their, 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 their military experiences and so forth. I am very encouraged for the future. I mean, our youth are fantastic. They are. They, they ask difficult questions. They uh, want to do what is right. They're bright, much brighter than we were with our, you know, when we were younger. Sure. Stuff like that. So I, I'm a real optimist for America. I think that our better days are ahead of us. I do. I agree. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, this has been one of my favorite times with someone because I thought I knew a lot about you. But uh, again, thank you for doing this and sharing these stories. This is going to go a long way. Got a little way. difficult at moments, but, but I hope. Your willingness to do it anyway, it meant the world to me because I know it's difficult to talk about some of these things. But your story is an inspiration. Uh, and nice uh, I'm you. just so glad you came in here. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you again, Guy. Thanks, man. You're my friend. This is why we do this this series. This is why we do Amazing Arizonans, and this is certainly one of them. So thanks for watching.